Support for Steppin' Out comes in part from the Kristovich family in honor of Mary Lou and Bill Kristovich. This program is sponsored in part by the Eugenie and Joseph Jones Family Foundation, a local foundation proud to support the arts and culture in the greater New Orleans area. Board and welcome to Steppin' Out with updates from the local restaurant, arts, and entertainment scenes. Joining me, Poppy Tooker, host of Louisiana Eats on WWNO Radio. Hey, Miss Poppy. Hello, dear. Hi. Hello, Peg. Hey. Ian McNulty, food writer for the Times Picayune, New Orleans Advocate. Howdy, Ian. Hello. Hi. <laughs> and it's been a while. Daniel Hammer, president and CEO of the Historic New Orleans Collection. Welcome, Daniel. Hello, dear. Hi. Hi, and thank you. Hello. Thanks. And Alan Smason of TheaterCriticism.com and the Crescent City Jewish News. Hello, Alan. Also, okay. we're so excited, Luke Fleming, and uh, joining him will be, there he is, Jacob Fowler of the Crescent City Chamber Music Festival. Hello, gentlemen. Hi. Back to you all a little later, but Poppy, Oktoberfest time has arrived. Yes, indeed. And you know, there's no real big Oktoberfest even happening in Germany this year. But we're so lucky in Louisiana because it's on at Middendorf, both in Manshack and Slidell. They're kicking off Oktoberfest next Thursday the 9th, running through Friday the 13th. Now, the menu changes every week, and it's all the favorites. Wiener schnitzel, sauerbraten, and spatzli, and the sauerkraut and pretzels, and, of course, a huge assortment of German beers. And for dessert, the apple strudel and the black forest cake alternate weeks. The great news is that even Horst Pfeiffer's brother Heinz is back this year with his accordion to entertain the crowd. So I wanted everybody to put on your lederhosen <laughs> and head to Middendorf's Wednesday and Thursdays in Manshack, Fridays in Slidell. And it's important to note that the regular menu remains available the whole time. So, Peggy. Prost. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So you have two choices there, too. How exciting. It's really, Absolutely. it's a pity that Deutsches Haus couldn't do it this year, but I understand they'll be back next year with it, too. But they are open, just like for sausage and stuff like that. But uh, yeah. anyway, go to Middendorf's for right now. Thank you. And over to Ian, another classic restaurant has reopened. Yes, Arno's reopened on Thursday for the first time for regular service in six months. They have been doing a lot of private dining and very small events in that, uh, well, that campus of, <laughs> of a restaurant that they have there. They were able to get pretty creative uh, to, to keep, keep a little bit of things going during the shutdowns. But now, now they're back. And Peggy, the reason I'm, I'm calling out some of these, these epic restaurants as, as they return is, is not so much that, you know, many restaurants are coming back. Uh, this is a restaurant that has many phases, many chapters of its own history. Uh, that's one of the things that's really so valuable about our historic restaurants. And they're also family owned. You know, these are big restaurants that tower large reputation, but when it comes down to it, they're run by families. And right now, I think anybody out there can, uh, can, can, can get on board with the idea that we're all going through different chapters of our lives. You know, we're writing new chap chapters of our family stories. Same thing is happening at these, these grand, historic, and important New Orleans restaurants. So Arno's, the story there has really for years uh, been a sort of gentle evolution, right? As the next generation of the family takes the reins, we just saw Archie Jr. and Katie with their mother, Jane. Uh, they've, um, they've been quite, quite creative in the, in the ways that uh, they've managed to put a next generation stamp on the restaurant while also maintaining its traditions. And uh, right now is a pivotal time. You know, restaurants like this are opening up with a lot of hope, uh, with, with great expectations, but also with you know, n natural trepidation about what the future holds for 
for the restaurant business in general, what the French Quarter is, will bring them, what, uh, you know, what, the, the future, there's a lot of questions in there, even for restaurants that have such a long track record. Uh, and what I've been encouraged with, Peggy, is the way that so many people have expressed an interest and stepped up and given them the support and the, the confidence to carry on and do things like this. So Arno's is back. Their, their wonderful bar, the French 75, is back as a restaurant. <laughs> you can sit in there and dine and have some French 75 cocktails. But it's just it's been great to see them uh, through every phase of this thing and, and wonderful to see Arno's back where it belongs. The store yes, indeed. Thank you. We certainly wish them well. And over to Daniel. Speaking of uh, the quarter, 520 Royal, to be precise, as we know, the historic New Orleans collection has quite the New Orleans quarter, French Quarter campus, but we're focusing on what used to be Channel 6. It is now your tricentennial wing, but you've got a lot of great exhibits opening up. Let's begin first with uh, the Acadian culture uh, focus, too. Yeah, thank you, Peggy. We're very excited to have exhibitions open again at the Historic New Orleans Collection. We have three exhibits now on view in our new building, the Tricentennial Wing, which is the new construction portion of the facility we opened at 520 Royal in 2019. So Cajun Document is a wonderful photography exhibition about Acadiana in the mid-1970s, featuring photographs by Charles Traub and Doug Boz, taken uh, between 74 and 75, and documenting uh, a place, but really the people of that place. Actually, we have a great feature on our website now, hnoc.org, where we ask people to help us identify some of the subjects of these photographs uh, if they happen to know who they are. So the photographs are really about the people of Acadiana. Yeah. We also have a wonderful exhibit of paintings from our permanent collection uh, called French Quarter Life, which again is about a place, the French Quarter, but really tells stories of people, all the paintings which uh, date through the 20th century from the early 20th century paintings by William Woodward, showing things like the Mortuary Chapel in the old Gates and Mercy Synagogue on Rampart Street to uh, 1998 uh, painting of a Mardi Gras balcony by Joseph Kanapka, Kanapka. So all these paintings show people and places of the French Quarter. And then finally, we have a wonderful new immersive experience downstairs in the Tricentennial Wing uh, by the artist Susan Gisselson, uh, about summertime in New Orleans that really features uh, outside, you know, New Orleans outside using uh, dynamic images from our collections that she's put together in these wonderful wall murals. And I think outside has changed a lot for us all uh, throughout the pandemic. And the space gives you a place to reflect on that and also just enjoy it's the museum. And, and course, you know, we have Go ahead. Sure. I was just going to say, what I'm I was just say, you know, it's free. It's that it's free. Now, you do have to go is. online to get a ticketed ticket because we want to be observed, you know, right. uh, COVID regulations, which we'll talk about in a minute. But uh, what a what a great thing. And you've got also, what, Cafe Core in the middle of, uh, in your in your courtyard, too, that, you know, that people can go to, huh? That's right. It's all free and open to the public uh, during our regular hours, Tuesdays through Sundays, uh, 9.30 to 4.30, although we open at 10 on Sundays. And um, it's Cafe Core is, is wonderful. The food and the drinks there are delicious, and people really love them. The Courtyard Course right now in the fall months is a beautiful place to spend time. The shop is open and uh, doing well. And, and uh, it's great you. to see people back in the French Quarter. That's okay. right. Thank That's you right. so much, Daniel. We'll be back to you a little later. And we're moving over to Alan. Alan, with uh, the Contemporary Arts Center, very busy from a theater standpoint as well as visual. Oh, yes. Well, actually, uh, we want to start off a little bit before that, before we get to the CAC, about a very important uh, production that's going on at the University of New Orleans, and that is Single Black Female. Uh, we'll get to uh, the CAC in just a minute. But, sure. But the current COVID-19 pandemic has essentially changed the dynamic on all of the universities and campuses. And the University of New Orleans, likewise, their Department of Theater and Film, has been busy uh, adding to their virtual uh, delivery of their uh, plays and their season offerings. And the first one is going to be Lisa B. Robinson's Single Black Female. It's actually been running for a couple of nights now. It's a two-hander, usually seen on stage, occupied by two women. 
Alexandria Miles and Danielle James are uh, basically graduate students who are starring in this Rishon made directed piece, and they're in two physically disconnected places. But through the miracle of the internet and director Rishon May, they they actually appear as if they're side by side and interact with one another as if they're on a single stage. Uh, the two of them take on the challenge of what it means to be a black professional in an unforgiving world, Peggy, and how unlikely it is that they'll ever find love, much less get married. A single black female is more likely to be hit by a meteor and then find a husband, one of them states. And, uh, you know, with their wine glasses in hand, the two divas actually uh, tackle a number of these black women problems with snappy repartee, clever dialogue, and uh, a really rapid-fire succession, fantastic wit without the, uh, the whole project. Uh, one cannot confuse this, however, with a certain female vehicle that endured on cable that is uh, not sex in the inner city. Uh, perhaps there's some hidden razors in those Manolo Blahniks, <laughs> but uh, there's uh, <laughs> two 30-something liberal women who have conservative values, who are looking for that right man to come along. Now, remember that some of these things that they're going to be saying are not going to make some of the white audiences out there feel mm -hmm. warm and fuzzy. It's not intended to make audiences feel comfortable, but it is an important work, and I recommend it very well. Uh, Miles and James are terrific in their interpretations, and I liked Rishon's clever and sharp directing in this. Even Oprah will be proud of this show. After all, she's not married uh, uh, Stefan yet, so uh, <laughs> she's a single black female, too. Right. And uh, over to the CAC, Vagabond Inventions and Renee Benson are offering the very first live Tempor a contemporary theater right now this weekend, Saturday night, tomorrow night at 8 o'clock, part dance, part theater. It's Requiem for a Stranger. It's going to be uh, on at 8 o'clock live, and it should run about a half an hour. I encourage people to see the very first live theater emanating on a virtual stage. Okay. Thank you very much. And moving over to Luke Fleming. It's so great to see him and uh, Jacob of the Crescent City Chamber Music Festival being held this weekend. Some chat Challenges you have, though, didn't you? Don't you? <laughs> well, for sure. I mean, this year was supposed to be, or was, is the the fifth anniversary, the fifth season of the Crescent City Chamber Music Festival, and we had a huge thing planned. And, and needless to say, COVID kind of threw a wrench in those plans. But uh, we've pivoted and uh, made a, a lot of uh, alterations to our format to make sure that we're still able to do the mission that we have had in New Orleans, but in a way that's safe and socially responsible. Well, you've got concerts coming up, and through those concerts, um, also, you'll be going to nursing homes. But this is all going to be virtual this year, correct? Yes, everything virtual. All of our concerts are going to be broadcast on Facebook Live and YouTube Live. Uh, all the information for those, they're, they're on the October 2nd, 4th. And 9th and 11th is on our website, CrescentCityChamberMusicFestival.com. Uh, what's on the program, ways you can view. Uh, and I should say that, you know, if, if you can't uh, view them at the time that they are actually being live streamed, they will remain on Facebook and YouTube indefinitely uh, for for you to, to view. So you, if you want to watch it again, you can watch it again, or you can um, see it at a later date, and that's fine. And as far as the outreach work we do goes, we have been uh, in direct contact with um, uh, with nurses and aides at nursing homes and hospitals, and, and uh, also with teachers at schools who are going to make these, um, make interactive performances available to their uh, residents and their students uh, via Zoom meetings. So we'll actually play for them in real time uh, and interact with them uh, via Zoom meeting that's like, um, you know, hooked up to a TV. Uh, so we're still able to, to do this outreach work in, a, in a safe way. And of course, uh, the concerts, because they're virtual, are free, but you can always go to CrescentCityChamberMusicFestival.com and make a donation. Is that correct? Yes, indeed. We're okay. a 501c3, and we very much appreciate this support. <laughs> yes, but and we're going to um, hear you and Jacob a little later in our program. We appreciate that. And now we're going to move back over. Hey, Jacob, we'll, we'll, we'll hear from you a little yes. later. Okay. But glad you're here. We're so glad. And moving back over to Poppy, talk about another tried and true French Quarter establishment. Well, Broussard's is part of Restaurant Week. And Restaurant Week usually would have been back in September. Well, it's kicking off Monday the 5th, running through Sunday the 11th. This is a very affordable time to support our restaurants because generally we're talking 
three courses for $39 or less at lunch, brunch, and dinner. There's 60 participating restaurants. And Broussard's, another one of our old classics, is continuing their centennial celebration with the Louisiana indigenous nut, the pecan. So from beef tartare to candied herb profiteroles, the pecans are the star. And then another participant is Red Gravy. Now, Chef Roseanne Roesticker moved Red Gravy uptown to Magazine Street a little earlier this year. And there's a fabulous brunch menu with house-made breakfast spaghetti. There's their three-course dinner for Restaurant Week. Starts, of course, with meatballs, with that famous red gravy and ricotta. And here's the craziest thing. Restaurant Week is colliding with culinary because there's over 20 restaurants that are continuing their culinary three courses for $39. Um, to give you an idea of how long the extensions are going on, you can find these bargains at the Chafalaya, the Bower through Halloween. The Pelican Club is offering their culinary menu through November 30th. But check this out. Appleine's three-course $30 brunch and $39 dinner is being offered through New Year's Eve, December 31st. So All check right. out those two websites and be prepared to get hungry. All right. Thank you so much. And if ever there was an example of um, a food destination reinventing himself, this was it. Right, Ann? <laughs> Well, yes, I think we're talking about Mayhew Bakery in Mid-City. And, uh, Peggy, I'm 100% behind the adage that good bakeries make great pizza. Uh, what's, a, what's a good bakery? What's a good pizzeria, after all, but a bakery uh, that is specialized in pizza? Well, at the pizza at Mayhew Bakery is also making a difference. It's made a difference for this young neighborhood business. Mayhew Bakery was opened just about a year ago by Kelly Mayhew after he made a name for himself at farmer's markets and at pop-ups, uh, selling his king cakes in particular. He got a real following from that. Well, the pandemic arrives. All of his restaurant clients shut down, many of which are still closed. Things look bleak. He has to lay off all of his staff, uh, just eking along there with his pastry chef, Jess. Reagan there. Uh, but they decided, let's let's try that pop-up thing again. But this time, let's do pizza. Let's use these these ovens that we usually use for our baguettes and our country loaves and, and make some New York-style pizzas. Well, the first pop-ups went over so well, they've added it permanently to the menu. Uh, now, Mayhew Bakery doubles as a pizzeria. They're adding some outdoor tables, and uh, the pizzas are flying out the door. They were able to rehire their staff. They've got, they've wow. got their, their full pre-pandemic staff back. Uh, they're cooking their entire regular bakery menu, bakery cafe menu. Um, but in the evenings, uh, those pizzas are the thing. Grid, uh, crisp crust, thin, New York style, uh, foldable but not floppy. That golden mean that people look for for a good New York slice. Uh, so fantastic place and really just so refreshing to see these small businesses that have been up against it so hard through this uh, able to find ways to change and connect with their customers and New Orleans people to come out and support them like that. It's, and of course, it's the good a lot news of this, about there, but stories like that. Yeah, and the good news right. about the 75% in terms of capacity this week. Oh, that's some good news too, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. We uh, need it could it. be. It's not a really a big deal for most restaurants because yeah. the um, the space between the tables is the main limitation. Oh. So they could be 100% capacity, but if they still have to maintain those six feet, that's it won't help point. them at all. So yeah, that's a very a large very restaurant point. will benefit. All right. Yeah. Thank you. And, and back to Daniel. And Daniel, I know you all had to put a lot of thought into COVID requirements over at the collection, too. Well, absolutely. And, you know, our, I guess our top priority from the get-go with the COVID pandemic has been health and safety, both for our staff and for our visitors. And so we've proceeded in a fashion to uh, make sure that we're always uh, taking the situation seriously and and never preventing, never presenting an environment where anybody is put at an increased level of risk. Yeah. And so we've been able to do that well. We were open exclusively outside for a long time, but now that we're able to be open inside, of course, we have masking requirements and capacity yeah. limits to help us keep things safe. Now, we and also have a lot of great A lot books. of publications coming up as yeah. well, huh? Yeah. It's hard to count. Yeah, I see the images uh, flashing there on the screen. And, uh, you know, we have wonderful publications out right now. We have some really exciting books that are available right now. The Cajun Document Exhibition has an accompanying photo book with it. And also we have a great uh, book that we published earlier this summer 
Afro-Creole poetry, which is translated and French original language poetry from the Civil War era from uh, radical black newspapers of New Orleans from that time. It's really an important book uh, translated by Clint Bruce and with an introduction by Angel Parham. Uh, we also have some really exciting books coming out in 2021. Uh, the Economy Hall, Hidden History of a Free Black Brotherhood by Fatima Sheikh, about the history of the uh, social aid and benevolent organization, The Economy Hall, um, which originated in 1836. And the story uh, goes all the way through the 1950s when Fatima's father actually found the records of this organization in a dump truck and saved them from, from the dump. And, and she's been able to work with them and create this incredible piece of scholarship. Also, a really special book, uh, Enrique Alferez Sculptor by Katie Bowler Young, which will also be published in early 2021, uh, supported by the Hellas Foundation very generously, as well as our Lozat Society and the Anvil Circle. So the support of uh, those groups has uh, allowed us to produce really a special uh, a publication about Enrique Alferez that includes, uh, is based in kind of unprecedented access to his personal papers and files as well as uh, over 100 images to make it a really beautiful right. publication. So we're really excited about what we're doing in Absolutely. our program right now. Thank you so much, Daniel. And moving back over to Alan for more theater. You know, their challenges abound, but people are still at it, and nationally as well, of course. Well, we talked last week about black and blue. And again, I have a picture that I wanted to show you from the 2018 cast of Black and Blue. This is, of course, the piece that we had that, that was dealing with uh, the, uh, the group that uh, honored uh, the life of Yvonne Bichet. And, and Yvonne passed away, unfortunately, in August. But she was one of the first black female officer recruits for the New Orleans Police Department. And if you look uh, on that particular uh, uh, picture, you'll see uh, some of the cast members there. The late Frederick Mead is in the uh, uh, left back uh, corner there, if you will. Uh, but there's Carol Sutton, who plays uh, the, the character based on the life of Yvonne in later life. And she's going to be portraying that same role again in this produ production. They're going to be doing live stream tomorrow on HowlRounds.com. And also right next to her was Cheryl Palmer, who will be also performing the younger and Broussard character uh, that we uh, were talking about. Uh, both of those uh, individuals, by the way, uh, are going to be part of that production tomorrow uh, on live stream and also on the theatercriticism.com Facebook page that I host. So I hope people will be able to see that. Also to see uh, Carol Sutton come back. She's had some recent surgery, so we're all pulling for her and, and glad that she's recovered from that. Uh, we'll have a conversation with Ariadne Blade, that's the playwright of Black and Blue, and Cheryl Palmer, who stars in the work, to Tonight on NOLA Theater Talk, and of course, it'll be archived for people who may miss it uh, throughout the uh, remainder of time. Uh, it's going to be on NOLA Theater Talk uh, Facebook group, the theatercruism.com Facebook page, and the YouTube Music Lovers 169 uh, channel that I have. Later on uh, this week, I hope that people will take uh, advantage of seeing The Shows Must Go On. That was the Andrew Lloyd Webber channel that is back up and running again. This week, it's Michael Ball, Past and Present. That's going to be on, available uh, at your direction whenever you want to live stream it uh, until 2 o'clock on Sunday. The Shows Must Go On YouTube channel. And don't forget about the Seth Rudetsky Seth Concert Series. Now, uh, we're going to have Andy Carl and Orpha, who, who met in Saturday Night Live on Broadway, uh, but they became uh, a couple in Legally Blonde when they met for the first time uh, previously, but they really worked opposite one another okay. in Legally Blonde and most recently in Pretty Woman. So check that out on Sunday at uh, 7 o'clock. Thank you so much. Now time for our picks of the week. Poppy. Nalsi just announced a new round of six different wine dinners with dates through November 4th, including Brennan's, Gianna, Boucherie. They're delicious. Okay, Ian. Gotro's restaurant is back, one of, that, uh, one of the finest restaurants in New Orleans, in my opinion. Uh, back open on Sonyette Street. Same staff, front of the house, back of the house. Uh, exquisite menu, once again, from Chef Baruch. It's a great place to see. Great. And, Daniel, that website, once again, because you've got a great website as well as a wonderful place uh, to go. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. My pick is definitely hnoc.org. You can get all the information you need there to plan your visit to our exhibits and our cafe and our shop, but also a lot of great stuff you can do online. 
including if you're a member and you can become a member at four, starting at $45, <laughs> our upcoming Williams Lecture, uh, Curator Chats, we're calling them now. Okay. Next one is October 17th. Also, we have a great Halloween tour of our history galleries that we'll be doing online this year, Dance Macabre, on October 30th. Okay. And we have uh, book clubs coming up and a food <laughs> forum in November, so lots of great virtual programs. Sounds great. Thank you so much. And Alan? I hope Alfred Richard don't, uh, doesn't mind that I mentioned Zeitgeist Theater for my pick this week. They're at 6621 St. Claude Avenue on Araby. Socially distanced air filter. They have scrubbers for their air conditioners. And the two shows this week, very important. The Keeper, a story about a goalie in, in soccer who actually was a Nazi and played for Scotland. It's a fascinating story how he actually came around and was uh, uh, basically a member of the United Kingdom after that and a great citizen. It's a great story. And then also Richard Wright's native son, that he starred in okay. is going to be on nightly. You can actually see this virtually as well, Peggy. Thank Just you so much, Anne. There. Now, my pick uh, on Saturday, many New Orleans galleries will be opening their doors for the annual Art for Art's Sake coordinated openings. Phil Sandusky, who paints outdoors, of course, has recently focused on the Warehouse District area, and the Degas Gallery will show 30 of his paintings kicking off with a reception on Saturday evening, 5 to 7, at 604 Julius and now it is time for Luke Fleming and Jacob Fowler performing Beethoven's duo for viola, or viola, we should say, and cello. Thank you all for watching, and goodbye. Good night. <laughs> Support for Steppin' Out comes in part from the Kristovich family in honor of Mary Lou and Bill Kristovich. This program is sponsored in part by the Eugenie and Joseph Jones Family Foundation, a local foundation proud to support the arts and culture in the greater New Orleans area. <laughs>